Thanks for tuning into The Scoop. I hope we can continue to serve as an important source of information and entertainment during these unprecedented times. I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Bitstamp, before we get started with the episode. They're the original global cryptocurrency exchange. Since 2011, Bitstamp has been a cornerstone of the cryptocurrency industry and the preferred exchange for serious traders and investors, trusted by over 4 million customers, including top financial institutions. Bitstamp is built on professional-grade trading technology. Their platform is powered by a matching engine from NASDAQ, the global stock exchange, and their APIs are consistently recognized as the best in the industry. Bitstamp's advanced trading interface, TradeView, features live charting, deep analytical tools, and is available on web and mobile. You can download the Bitstamp app from the App Store or Google Play, or visit bitstamp.net slash pro to learn more and to start trading today. That's bitstamp.net slash pro. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to what is a very special episode of The Scoop. I'm excited to have on the other side of the mic, David Mercer, the CEO of LMAX, which operates cryptocurrency exchange LMAX Digital. If you don't know about LMAX Digital, they first gatecrashed the digital asset trading world two years ago. If you're listening to this episode on Tuesday, this is the two-year anniversary of LMAX Digital. And they've clocked in $85 billion worth of crypto traded since launch, which totals to 25 million trades in total. I'm really excited to have David on, obviously to talk about the growth of LMAX, but also just to share the perspective of a cryptocurrency exchange in the midst of this ongoing health and financial crisis. We've had many traders, high frequency traders and macro investors come on the show but David, you are actually the first exchange operator to come on the scoop since we all went remote and since markets began whipsawing at the end of February. So thank you so much for coming on. I guess that's where I'd want to start. If you hearken back the past two, three months, operating an exchange in this environment couldn't have been easy, right? We've seen at crypto native exchanges, a lot of outages. There's been myriad of issues across markets, pricing issues, liquidity issues. From your vantage point, we'll start with LMAX Digital. We can maybe dive into the FX side of the house later. But in terms of LMAX Digital, what has this market meant for your operations? Hi, Frank, and hi to all your listeners. I hope everyone's well. And uh sending our thoughts out to all the families affected in this pandemic. So look, obviously it's unheralded and no business was properly prepared. We're relatively fortunate in that we've been going 10 years in total as LMAX Group. We run five exchanges globally. We're squarely a fintech operation. I have software development as far afield as Auckland, and we operate in 11 offices globally. So I guess we've gone from 11 offices to about 150 offices, if you consider I have 150 employees. So the first thing was, you know, you saw it coming from Asia. We had a heads up, if you like, from our Singapore offices and our Hong Kong offices. We saw what happened there in terms of AB splits, in terms of, you know, country lockdown. So we went ahead and the, everyone who wasn't enabled to, to work remotely, we went out and purchased a whole lot of laptops and screens and monitors and chairs if required. And then we trialed it. We trialed it on a, an AB team basis. And if I'm honest with you, it's worked remarkably well. In some cases, productivity has been better. And some of that's just because we work in the middle of London and people don't maybe have the hour, hour and a half commute. So I don't know how, how, how good it will be long term in terms of culture, in terms of training, in terms of overall camaraderie. But for this enforced hiatus from the office, so far, so good. And our primary concern, obviously, was our employees and their families. So their well-being was number one. And uh, number two was the, the well-being of the wider public, so not to contribute to the spread of this disease. And third, and only third, if I'm honest, came business. We thought we would be able to operate okay, and that's proven to be the case. 
The reality is we open our foreign exchange markets on a Sunday night uh, in UK time every week, and that's done remotely. Um, a lot of, we have a lot of 24 hour coverage. So that's been pleasantly surprising. Overall in our markets, March was tough across all asset classes. You saw that knock on effects in oil, gold, and basically delivery in commodity markets. So that all went up the left, so to speak. Um, and massive sell-offs, you know, massive risk off. So we had all the, this peak in volatility and this peak in volume, which is actually good for exchanges like ourselves. So in the core business, we saw that, we coped with it, liquidity held up well. And then, of course, we were looking for this correlation, if you like, in Nailmax Digital. And we saw it. Ultimately, people who tell you there's no correlation with the S&P and the like, just look at it. Maybe there's no correlation because Bitcoin got sold off the most against the dollar uh, in March. What I would say is that it held up well, it rebounded well. And I think that's a you know, hats off, if you like, to the industry and to the, to the authors of some of these cryptocurrencies and uh, that they've been so resilient. With regards to the, the crypto space itself and the market structure issues you mentioned, look, some of the, I'm, I'm not about to go around and bang other retail platforms over the head for the outages that they may have suffered. It's difficult. They suddenly have X million customers trying to log in and ask complex questions. And that, that's hard technology to build. You know, whereas if you're, if you're building a, an exchange, we answer a few simple questions and we can handle many, many, many tens of thousands of those questions in any given millisecond. Basically, the questions they ask are, can I buy or can I sell? And um, when you're operating these retail platforms that, that are truly trading platforms rather than exchanges, there are many questions you can ask, you know, deposits, withdrawals, wallet balances, charts, all of those things that's hard that's hard to account for when everyone's rushing for the exit door, if you like, at the same time. So, yep, I, I know they, they experienced a few of those outages. Certainly in terms of pricing, it's self-fulfilling in crypto right now. It's a relatively, it's still a nascent asset class. You haven't got the depth of liquidity you have in other asset classes. So it's self-fulfilling prophecy in that people start to sell, everyone else starts to panic. Uh, and all of a sudden, you go into a bit of a tailspin. So we saw that when you saw Bitcoin, you know, hitting hitting the lows of four thousand dollars. But ultimately, it found its floor and it bounced back up. That is remarkable, given the lack of central bank intervention. There's no one there. It found its own floor, and it recovered. You know, and it's rallied up through ten thousand, and it's hovering around there now. So that actually was remarkable. Given all the stimulus packages you've seen in other asset classes, and people were paying you to take oil. Let's be clear about it, right? In the middle of March, when Bitcoin was dumping, the chart said this thing goes to zero. Well, it didn't go to zero, but guess what? Another well-known asset, oil, went to zero and beyond. Now, I'm being a little bit trite there, and obviously there were other, there were other issues around that. But I think the performance overall in this new asset class has been excellent through what is, as I say, unheralded. Well, if you want to talk about things being trite, this idea or notion that in this crisis we should expect the unexpected is something that we've been thinking about at the block. It seems cliche, but when you think about things like oil going below zero or Bitcoin rebounding quickly from, I think it hit as low as 3,800 on some exchanges, it's really quite phenomenal. And we can talk about some of the market dynamics at play that have helped Bitcoin sort of resurge from those lows. But going back to the business for a second, right? Most of our listeners are going to be familiar with how exchanges make money and when they make money, right? When volatility increases, you see an increase in volumes, typically, which is obviously good for marketplaces that are in the business of sitting between traders, right? And so you even look at the volatility we saw this past Sunday with Bitcoin sort of shedding more than 10% in a matter of minutes, which we're used to at this point, right? The market is not for the faint of heart. And on that day, Coinbase suffered a brief outage as a result of that price decline. I guess my question is, and it's a bit of a tough question, or maybe not because you are a tough guy, but 
when you think about these retail platforms that you talk about, the Coinbase's of the world that have not been immune from these technical issues. I mean, we're still printing volume on Sunday, May 10th at Coinbase, 442 million compared to LMAX's 128 million. So obviously you guys have only been around for two years, but when you look at that juxtaposition of a retail platform being out and maybe from the perspective of certain traders, not being up to snuff or not being robust enough from an infrastructure perspective, juxtaposed with LMAX, which is basically essentially leveraging your FX technology. Why do you think there's such a difference between the volumes these two exchanges are printing? I mean, two different things, right? So um, let's pick it up a little bit. So for a start, I'm an institution only exchange. So LMAX Digital, I'll always trade, always as a long time at um, for now, I trade less at the weekend than I would do Monday to Friday by virtue of the setup in those institutions. That's the reality. I'm much closer to those retail platforms. And normally I'm, I rank number one, number two, day in, day out. So our ADV in LMAX Digital's ADV in May has been about $250 million. Strangely, when retail wakes up at the weekend, we do less because we have less institutional players involved. So through May, uh, I'm a quarter of a billion dollars day in, day out. So I'm very happy with that. But that comes from much fewer participants, right? You're talking about a, a couple of hundred of institutional customers, maybe only a hundred who are trading in anything like significant size, trading day in, day out. Take that to the retail guys who are dealing with millions of customers. They're just different businesses. I think they everyone needs to be honest with themselves here. I mean, the retail platforms are not exchanges. They're not exchange businesses. They are brokerage businesses. There's a lot of merit in that business. You know, I run a broker myself, uh, which is LMAX Global here. But the requirements of that cust of those customers are very much more far-reaching than they are of exchanges. Um, institutional customers on exchange simply need some market data and they want an ability to buy and sell quickly over a range of APIs. Now, when you run a retail platform, it's no different than when you go to a comparison website or a travel website, right? That retail customer wants everything. He wants every single coin he can possibly think of listed, whereas we only list the top five against dollars, euros, and yen. They want a whole range of charts. They want a whole range of news. They want a whole range of, of chat functionality. They want the ability to deposit, withdraw. As I'm saying, if you think about designing that architecture, that software, there are so many questions you have to answer as a software provider. So those retail brokers, I think, do a good job at that. But naturally, if you think about it, you just have this much wider range of a million customers. It's not dissimilar to the shopping websites coming on at the same time, asking a myriad of different questions. Now, that is a tough tech nut to crack. Institutional, we, we answer much less questions and our speciality is processing billions of orders every day. I mean, at LMAX Group, we literally process over 4 billion orders every single day, right? We process 80,000 orders most seconds, uh, and we scale to go way beyond that. That's how we built LMAX Digital. That's how we've been so robust, and that's how we haven't had one second of downtime since launch. So very, very different proper business propositions. I think when I look and I see that disparity between volumes in the weekend, it tells me the institutions aren't quite here yet, right? So you're going you're gonna to say to me, hold on a minute, well, well Paul Tudor Jones said he's uh, allocating some of his portfolio, which is great, but it happened this week and it's 2% of his portfolio. And he's the first to break ranks, right? So, you know, we need many more of them and we need many more of them realizing that this market trades seven days a week, not five days a week. As I say, Monday to Friday, LMAX Digital is very happy to compete with uh, all those retail platforms out there. And what I'd say to those retail platforms is when they struggle with liquidity, when they struggle with pricing, they should come to LMAX Digital. They should be customers of mine, right? They are very good at sales and marketing. They are very good at running brokerage operations. And they're very good at dealing with retail, including onboarding them. Quite simply, if I had a million customers apply to, to sign up with LMAX Digital tomorrow, we couldn't do it. But these guys are opening hundreds, hundreds of thousands of accounts per day. And I take my hat off to them. 
But running an exchange efficiently, so you have no downtime, so you have low latency, so you have high capacity, is a very different tech stack. And they can't do both. So they should come and be my customers. I think you make a good point, David. And, and there's the pitch for the crypto native exchanges out there who might want to hop on the phone with you. I'm looking at a chart from our research team that shows legitimate volume on spot exchanges from January 2019 onward. You guys are represented in a really, I guess this is a fuchsia or like a purple, but in any case, whatever color it is, you guys exploded from January 2019 to the summer of 2019 and have remained pretty steady from that point on. Do you think that's an indication of institutional interest in the market sort of staying steady or the firm reaching the threshold of institutional players in the market? That's one question. The second question is, how do you then build on that? Like, To what degree has LMAX Digital been about sales and outreach versus you know, just sort of looking for the flock to um, find its way to the firm? Yeah, that's a good way, good way of looking at it. It's a bit of both, Frank. I would say our penetration in the true institutional market is solid. There was a report came out recently, I think it was a PwC report, and look, the names listed at the back were either engaged with, onboarded with 80%. So we need more. There just isn't enough institutions. You know, the um, Shooter Jones announcement this week was helpful, but we need many more funds to come. We need banks to come who will provide the credit to those funds. And so we can't build it on our own. But I think, you know, it's clear if, if you look at any league table, we're far and away the number one institutional spot cryptocurrency exchange. Now, the reality is a lot of uh, the funds right now or the speculators to start with are trading the future. Even the announcements this week, when you're looking at it, are you really trading crypto if you're just trading the future? Or are you just taking a, are you just taking a portfolio diversification view, right? Because there's no real exposure. You're not really an asset holder. What we all need as an industry is people to want to own this asset. You know, you go to Warren Buffett, right? He, he says, buy things that you want to own. Imagine there's no stock market. What do you want to own, right? And to be fair, that's the retail market, right? The hodlers. They want to own Bitcoin. They want to own cryptocurrency. At the moment, you're not seeing many institutions say, we want to own it, but we want to speculate in it, right? We want to, we want to have the potential upside or the portfolio hedge. So look, I think our penetration right now is excellent within the institutional space, but I'm never going to be printing the retail volumes because quite simply, we can't onboard those retail customers. So we need, we need more intermediaries, right? So we need more of those brokers coming in and onboarding with us. And we need more asset managers, more fund managers to get involved in this new asset class. I believe it's going to happen. You know, I made some crazy predictions for the price of Bitcoin at the end of the year, and I still think that's going to happen. You can never time it. But what this has shown us, this latest pandemic, is that people want this uncorrelated asset. People want this decentralized asset. People want this frictionless trade. So I'm very happy. I mean, it's my fastest growing exchange I've ever built at LMAX Group. We've, as I said, we've built five exchanges in 10 years. LMAX Digital has been going two years. And it's the fastest growing by far. So I'm pretty sure that uh, if we roll this call forward five years, you know, you'll be talking, it may not be me, it might be Jenna who runs uh, LMAX Digital today, but you'll probably be talking to Jenna Wright, who's the, the head of the biggest cryptocurrency exchange in the world. I want to talk to you about what some of those institutions are thinking about the thesis of Bitcoin in this market environment. But I want to continue on this thread to what degree do you think the further growth of LMAX Digital is tied to new players coming in, brokers, intermediaries, funds versus eating up more of the existing pie? It's the former. It's clearly the former. You know, I, I think the market will calm down. So that some of the brokers who provide good brokerage services to retail customers will simply be saying, look, I give you all this other stuff. I give you the news. I give you the charts, right? I give you ease of access. You know, I'm your friend. I'm your broker. But guess what? I don't try and run liquidity. I don't try and manage risk. I don't try and manage liquidity, 
right? I want to pass that all through to this institution exchange over there. It's called LMX Digital, right? So I think, I think that's what's going to happen. That's what happens in every other asset class in the world. You all know about the you know, very public exchanges that trade FX, that trade equities, that trade futures in Chicago, New York, and London. This is how crypto is going to evolve because I'm going to have all the institutional liquidity those retail brokers, those retail exchanges need. And when you have crises, right, and it's going to happen again and again and again, you need institutional liquidity to hold that up. And it will hold it up. You won't see the tailspin. The tailspin that starts in some of these retail exchanges, well, let's say, let's face it, the average trade size is less than $100. And they just get into a tailspin. They haven't, got a, they haven't got liquidity. There's no buyer of last resort there. The institutions will come in and they'll provide that liquidity. So I think that's the, that's the ecosystem going forward, which should help Elmax Digital. But moreover, I've had more inquiries this year, many more inquiries from banks, from funds than we did in 2019. They're getting ready. And why are they getting ready? And this is important. Frankly, those banks, those institutions, probably don't care at this stage about investing in what is such a small asset class, but their customers are asking. Their customers want cryptocurrency in their portfolio. And if you want to keep hold of that customer and you don't want to lose it to a retail crypto broker, well, you better provide access. And that access is going to be on institutional exchanges like LMAX Digital. So I'm very confident that in the next 12, 24 months, you're going to see some Really big names enter the market, really big names. And I mean, investment bank names enter the market. And they'll provide custody. They'll provide credit to their customer. And they'll be looking for the best liquidity available, which I believe will be LMAX Digital. Well, at this point, I think LMAX has around 170 clients. So, I mean, it's not like we've stalled in terms of building that client base. When we look at some of the recent names that have made headlines, whether it's Paul Tudor Jones, as you mentioned, or Renaissance Technologies, they made headlines because they updated a regulatory filing that showed that they would invest some of their capital into Bitcoin futures. Paul Tudor Jones, in his letter, said that they might do the same. But we're talking about futures here. Do you think that the lack of robustness on these spot cryptocurrency exchanges that are more well-known might be playing into why these funds are investing in in futures as opposed to spot. And a follow-up question to that is how do we as a market or LMAX Digital get folks from just dabbling in derivatives to, hey, let's help you, you know, onboard and access the spot market itself? It's a good question. It's a good question. And I think it's okay for me not to know. Um, I understand it. A lot of these larger groups, you know, prop trading groups, they're dipping their toe in the water and they're touching futures. It's safer. You know, they don't have exposure. They haven't got the AML risk of touching a coin and wondering where that's been. Um, they haven't got credit risk of dealing with various counterparties on these OTC platforms. So I understand it. And they have the economic upside and the economic downside. Theoretically, they have the liquidity. But I want to take you back to the future and have a look at the oil market and have a look at the gold market. Did we have the liquidity when we needed it? Now, look, the cash settled for now. So they're dipping their toe in the water. I think that's a good thing. But I think when you really talk about the growth of an asset class, you need people to want to own it and they need to buy spot. So they're not there yet. Most of those issues are still AML issues. There's not many household names out there that are comfortable holding Bitcoin today. Um, that's going to change. I saw some good reports from the likes of Elliptic recently um, saying, you know, the way they grade coins and saying how many had been effectively on the dark web historically versus how many are on, have been on there now. And it's almost less than 1% now. So that's a good thing. I think we need to solve that. We need to have better banking, no doubt. Another good announcement this week. And we need better credit. Once we have better credit, then I think you're going to see people understanding that holding the asset itself is key and will transition to spot. Don't get me wrong, you know, in, in capital markets as a whole, derivative markets are typically bigger than spot markets. So we have to see, see how that develops. You know, it might be possible for LMAX Digital to move into, into other products. Uh, we've tried 
you know, on the brokerage side of our business in LMAX Global, we've tried crypto CFDs. They actually, they haven't taken off so well. Why is that? That's mostly a leverage issue because you can trade on some of the derivative crypto exchanges and get, frankly, obscene leverage, right? So the regulators in Europe, for example, have put a maximum two to one leverage on crypto. That's not very attractive when you can go and trade with an so unregulated anonymous, correct? So you can go and trade Come with on. some, Give me some, re- some retail derivative exchange. That's it. <laughs> why wouldn't you want? Why wouldn't you want 100x when it can when it can move 50 percent down in a heartbeat? All those exchanges, all those platforms out there that are offering 100 to one, it's kind of ludicrous in this asset class, especially when you look into their KYC policy. But you know that's why on the retail side, other products haven't worked so far. But we'll look at other products to bolster spot. But I do believe that for the real growth of this asset class, you need an efficient spot market, and you need more owners rather than buyers to come into the market. I hope you're enjoying the episode so far, but real quick, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Pax Gold. Pax Gold is the world's only regulated gold token, and it's the fastest and easiest way to own and trade the highest quality physical gold. One Pax Gold token represents one fine troy ounce of a 400 ounce London Good Delivery Gold Bar stored in Brinks's vaults in London. When you buy Pax Gold, you own physical gold. The value of Pax Gold is always directly tied to the real-time market value of gold. Pax G is an ERC20 token on Ethereum and can easily be moved or traded anywhere in the world 24-7. With Pax G, anyone can now own a fraction of an LBM accredited London Good Delivery Gold Bar, and that's with zero storage fees. Trade it today on leading exchanges like Kraken, FTX, and Ipbit, or earn interest on your Pax Gold holdings through Nexo or Crypto.com. Learn more or purchase Pax Gold at Paxos.com slash Pax Gold. I was talking to a employee of one of the major banks about the Paul Tudor Jones news, and he was sharing some messages that he had gotten from potential clients, family offices asking for access to futures, for an example, other clients who maybe wanted to trade swaps, different structured products. We have one client interested in a capital protection note on Bitcoin, another client asking if they were offering Bitcoin mini futures or warrants. So this is kind of paralleled with the derivatives market growing in crypto generally, especially in Asia. How important is the growth and development of these derivatives? And to what degree does the fact that the market is booming on these unregulated Asian exchanges versus maybe some of the ones here in the US, is that an impediment to the growth of this market or not necessarily? Oh, you like to what you like to ask the, the hard ones. Look, there's some of the some of the derivative exchanges out there. It's very simple. Good luck to them. They're they're making a lot of money. Um, the customers seem happy, but they don't pass basic AML. That's it, right? They don't abide by FATF regulation. That's it, right? You can open an account with an email address. There's no country in the world who sign up to ATF that says that's, that's okay. So there's a lot of names there, big names trading big volumes today that won't be around. They will not be around in 10 years' time. Their customers are going to have to move somewhere else. They're going to have to move somewhere more reputable. And guess what? They might have to move somewhere where they're offered the protection of regulation, where they're offered the protection of balance sheet. I think there'll be a a natural evolution there. You know, the also these some of these companies aren't creating real corporate value. They're creating great dividend stocks because it's very hard to create corporate value if ultimately you're finding loopholes in regulation. You're finding loopholes in global AML policies. So it doesn't hinder it right now. I'd say, I'd say to everyone, look, any publicity you get for crypto currencies, crypto assets is good, right? The more people we have knowing about it, understanding this asset out there, the better. But look, you know, as I say, I don't touch retail. I just have a note of caution to all the guys out there. This thing is volatile. It is whippy. You know, you said yourself where, uh, you know, the price came off 10% before the halvening and, you know, if, if you're trading on 10 to 1 leverage, it means you're wiped out. 
but you haven't been wrong. That's what people have to understand about trading on leverage. You haven't been wrong, right? You wanted to own, you wanted to own this thing. Well, go own it. Go own the spot. Or go buy the derivative on less leverage. Frankly, if you're trading this very new asset class with a lot of volatility around it, a lot of unknowns, using leverage, you might as well go to the casino. All you have to do is look at some of those lost socialization funds, right? Um, look at how much is in there and you'll it'll tell you how much some of these retail customers have lost. Now, they'd have much greater protection in, in a regulated environment. So it's good in one way in that it helps the PR of the asset class. It's bad in that you're damaging, <laughs> damaging people's wealth and you're damaging their first experience in this asset class. So my advice is if you want to touch it, own it. Almost ignore the price. There's some good guys out there, some of the US exchanges out there are sort of saying, you know, own it, forget about it. I know we have this phrase, hodling, but it's kind of like that. You've got to believe it. You don't want to own it. Imagine there was no platform. Imagine there was no exchange. Imagine there was no liquidity. What do you want to own in 20, 30 years time? Well, you do that via the cash, right? If you're trying to make a quick buck, you got two choices, trade on 101 leverage or go to the casino. I want to take a step back and, and focus on the business again for a second. It's a question I was thinking about as I was preparing for this interview, and it's something I've never asked you. When you look at these two businesses, the FX business, the crypto business, clearly at the end of the day, a lot of these things could end up becoming intertwined, especially when you think of things like stable coins, right? A lot of people are looking at stable coins as a way to improve trading in the FX market. When you look like five years down the road, 10 years down the road, and obviously you don't have a crystal ball. And I'm kind of just asking as a sort of thought experiment like question, but when you look at the FX market and crypto as it pertains to LMAX or as it pertains just broadly, how do these things, what's sort of the thread that might pull them together? The world, the capital market world, Right, the capital market industry has a lot to thank the crypto industry for. Okay, now it's it's a bit like the challenger banks that you're seeing being launched in the traditional world. Okay, I mean, this thing was launched what 12 years ago now. Um, the relatively short white paper, and what's it taught people? It's taught market access. Wow, look how quickly, with relatively limited marketing budgets. We can access a wide client base. Look how easy it is to trade seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I don't know if you saw it, but at the start of this pandemic, the equity exchanges and some of the players in it were sort of saying, hey, let's have shorter sessions. Shorter sessions? My goodness, they only open eight hours a day, right? You know, I mean, you know, we've always had this, we've always had this, this ego thing in foreign exchange. We're open, you know, 24, five days a week, which is great, but we still have two days off. You know, why can't Euros move on a Saturday or on a Sunday? Why can't dollars do that? You know, why can't you take a view on, on dollar Mexico on a Saturday or Sunday? So thank you, crypto world, right? Why can't I earn interest constantly, instantaneously? Why have I got to wait two days for something to clear? Why can't I send money easily to Frank? So the capital market industry has got a lot to, to, to thank them for. Now, what I would say is that on the, on the flip side to some of the crypto evangelists, you know, if you go right down to the, the guys who started it, the initial evangelists, they want a decentralization. They wanted trustless, they wanted anonymous, and they wanted frictionless, right? So frictionless is excellent, comparatively speaking, in crypto world, right? You have many frictionless transactions or relatively low friction transactions. In capital markets, there's a lot of friction. there, And the fact that it takes two, day, two days for currencies to clear is something we need to fix. Decentralization, excellent really excellent, but at some stage, we're gonna to have to create some hubs for that credit I'm talking about. If you want the world to trade this, we're gonna need better credit. Ultimately, Frank, you're not gonna send, you know, you're happy to buy a Bitcoin or two from someone you've never met. You're happy to buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin or Ethereum, but you know, you're not gonna sell them your, all of your wealth. You're not gonna put your pension, send your pension fund to them, right? So we're gonna need some better credit. So the crypto world has to learn a little bit about the hub and spoke model that works in credit, in capital markets, and can work well on exchanges with default funds, et cetera, that stand behind um, people who might default. So I, th I, think, I think naturally they're gonna to move together. I mean, honestly, I see, you know, I look at the FX market and I think, well, 24 seven, why not instantaneous? Why not? 
earning interest intraday. Why not? I want to pivot to the FX market. I, I think it's really cool that you you are in both of these worlds because it provides additional context. And that's what we're really trying to do with the show now is bring on outside voices. In a sense, you are a voice we've known for a while, but you still have that additional perspective, which I think is super valuable for our listeners. It's funny, I was reading a report a couple weeks ago, and this was from the beginning of the year. So January 29th, before all of this market turmoil sort of gripped the world. And one of the biggest concerns that FX traders and market participants were concerned about at the beginning of the year was liquidity, right? This ability to move in and out of different p- positions with ease. And, you know, obviously liquidity is fine when markets are running smoothly and prices aren't swinging unabatedly. But I wonder if some of these FX traders were you know, looking into a crystal ball because what then happened, right? The markets went insane. And in many cases, liquidity dried up in some of the deepest, most liquid products that you could find, right? Like I think U.S. Treasuries, you know, which is kind of the bedrock of capital markets to an extent, there were liquidity and pricing uh, issues. So what are some of the parallels between crypto in terms of liquidity, volatility, And relative to, this is two questions. I'm baking in two questions into this. The follow-up question would be when you hearken back on your several decade career, I don't want to, I don't want to age you to the audience, but when you hearken back on your career, this period for the FX market, how has it been unique versus maybe past crises? Yeah. Every crisis is different. You know, as you say, I'm, I'm old enough. I've been around. So, um, you know, probably the thing that I remember I was in the back office uh, in 89 when um, Sterling left the ERM. I think they called it, I can't remember if it was Black Wednesday or Monday. It was one of the two. But anyway, uh, that was immense. That was a bit of a shock. I was there in the Asian crisis, crisis in 97. There in the uh, Russia crisis and the emerging market crisis in 98, obviously through 2008. And now you've got now. Plus, in between, we have relative blips now, such as the... Uh, S and B removing the the peg on the Swiss franc in 2015. The sterling flash crash after uh, after the referendum. A yen flash crash last year, and then of course you've got a Bitcoin crash every other week. So there are parallels. What I'd say, what I'd say first of all in terms of parallels is that capital markets have seen it all, um, but every crisis is different. I mean, look, not in my lifetime have we seen negative oil. But that's a delivery problem. That's not a pricing issue. That's not a liquidity issue. That's a that's a delivery um, problem there. So if you like, it's a, it's more fulfillment and logistics rather than it is capital markets. Now, everyone who's been around the block will tell you there's always liquidity, Frank, but you may not like the price it's at. You, you saw it. There was always liquidity in the Bitcoin crash most recently when it traded down to 3,800. But there was no bids on the way down. It was the same in the SNB in 2015. It was the same uh, with busted loans effectively in 2008. It was the same uh, in the Russian crisis in 1998 or the Asian crisis in 1997. So they've seen it all. There are gaps. What happens in the what happens is generally in the intervening seven to 10 years, which is typically what we do between between recessions or between between crises is that people get overconfident. It can't happen, right? The peg can't the peg can't be removed, right? Bitcoin can't crash. Bitcoin's going to go to the moon. Now listen, Bitcoin can go to the moon and still trade below six thousand again, okay? Because on a long term basis, this thing charts well. So there are the parallels. You know, there's some great old investing books out there. One that goes back to 1929, uh, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. I recommend everyone reads it, right? There's, there's nothing that happens today that didn't happen in 1929, okay, in terms of the way markets behave. Never believe this thing can't drop 50%. It's almost inevitable at some stage it will, okay? So you've got to position yourself like that. People don't go, people don't go bust because of the trading losses. They go bust because of cash flow. And that's the liquidity issues you've seen in capital markets. 
And that's the issue. There'll be a whole bunch of crypto investors out there who are sitting there looking at this thing at 9,000 or 10,000 thinking, oh my goodness, I was right on a loan. I paid 7,000 for it. But do you have any Bitcoin today? No, why? Because I got stopped out at 4,000. Okay, we use leverage too much. These, these are the parallels between the two markets. So for FX, yeah, this one's different. It's been a bit different, but ultimately the overriding issue is still the same. Everyone's shorting. Everyone needs to borrow. The price of borrow goes up. Do we have enough to borrow to cover the short position? That's more or less it. And if you're trading crypto on leverage today, it's do I have enough cash to make myself good, to answer my margin call and still hold on to the asset that I believe in? So that's my, you know, that's my point of caution. It's like you don't mark to market the apartment you buy, right? The villa you buy on a daily basis. If you did, you'd be on the street one day and in a bed the next and vice versa, right? Unfortunately, this is what some people are doing because they're, they're trying to follow the get rich quick scheme of using obscene leverage to own an asset that they can't really afford to own. They just need to have initially to own um, less of it. So yeah, there are parallels. I think because we're so early in the life cycle of cryptocurrencies, you're seeing gaps exacerbated and you know, we're sort of becoming desensitized to a 10% gap. It's not really a big gap now unless it's 50%. Correct. 100%. Well, I think it'd be an interesting closing point since you brought it up. But when you think about the learnings that will come from this crisis, crypto and then just broader markets, what are those learnings in your view? What has this exposed? What has this revealed about the crypto market that we didn't know before? And what has it exposed and revealed about the broader markets that we maybe were not keenly paying attention to? <laughs> I'll give you one. I'm, sort of, I'm laughing because uh, every regulated company in the UK, in the US, in Europe has to fill in a risk register and send it off to the regulator on a monthly basis. Um, I don't know how many had a pandemic <laughs> in the risk register, but I'm telling you, it's on everyone's risk register for the next, well, forever. Right, as long as you and I are around, seriously, pandemic is going to be on the risk register. And you know, you have to put a dollar. What's interesting about risk registers, certainly uh, under FCA and ESMA rules, you have to put a dollar number beside your risk weightings. So it could be liquidity risk, operational risk, all of this good stuff. Now you have to have pandemic, and you've got to weight, put a dollar value beside it, and that's the amount of capital you need. So we've all got, we've all learned about that, and. I guess when you're looking at BCP, business continuity uh, planning, everyone's always laughed about that. As long as I was in banking, everyone laughed. It's like, yeah, yeah, there's some crappy old office 10 miles away with computers that are five years old. It'll never work. <laughs> uh, guess what? They're all being used now. People are going to pay attention to that. So I think we've learned that. I think crypto, if you ask me about the crypto market, it's relatively unaffected. I mean, the most interesting thing in the last few months for crypto has been halving. That's it. Otherwise, the pandemic's hardly affected it. It's affected you know, guys like me in terms of prospecting and selling, I guess. But ultimately, it was just, it was unbroken. The companies, the large companies that operate had to learn. So I think it's going to be, it could be good for us. I mean, it's great to trust your employees more now. We're now trusting everyone to work from home. I say we, I mean the world. Is trusting everyone. It used to be, you know, you trusted the top guns, the mavericks, you trusted the older guys, the experienced guys. You can work from home a day a week, two days a week, whatever. Now we have to trust everyone. So you're going to have this great mobility of workforce that expands your talent pool. Right? And it means you don't have to just live on, you know, if you're on the East Coast, or what I can own, or you're in New York City, oh, it's a bit of a stretch if I live in New Jersey. Not anymore. Well, what about if I live in California? What about if I live in Florida? No, you have a mob mobility of, of workforce and you have this talent puts wider. And guess what? Everyone's lifestyles might be better. You know, rather than paying your high rents in, in Manhattan or the city of London, go a bit further afield because you know you have to go to the office only one day a week or two days a week or four days a month. So there's other ways to do it. And then think about the social benefits. Maybe we'll all wise up to climate change now. Maybe we, 
genuinely, are you looking at the blue skies in New York City, in London? I saw a great picture the other day of, um, of LA. So somebody tweeted it out and said, wow, we've got mountains. You know, they haven't seen mountains there in a decade. What are these? What are these things jetting into the sky? So I think there could be some real positive, real positive benefits. And, and the other thing I've always despised is, you know, people struggling into work when they're sick, you know, coming into my office. And I'm like, well, what are you doing here? You just want to infect everyone. So I think that's gone for good because we're all now very aware of it. So I th- I hopefully there'll be some good things to come out of it. As I say, my heart does, our hearts must go out to the people who have been affected and, and lost loved ones. And we hope it doesn't happen again. And we hope they find a vaccine soon. But um, through all that pain, um, I see some upside in um, for everyone socially and professionally. In the darkness, there is sometimes hope. David, I might need your help in convincing our CEO to uh, let me work remote after this. I don't know if he will be as give me as much leeway as you might. But in any case... <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. And um, I guess a happy birthday is in order to some extent. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you very much, Frank. Enjoyed it. I'd like to give our sponsor Bitstamp a big thank you. The original global cryptocurrency exchange. Bitstamp is built for professional traders, yet intuitive enough for any investor. You can use Bitstamp's advanced trading interface, TradeView, to execute your strategy or instantly buy crypto in seconds when the opportunity strikes, all from your computer or mobile device. Bitstamp prides itself on delivering unmatched customer service with a human touch. Their global customer care team is available around the clock via telephone, email, and social media. When you contact them, you'll always speak to an actual person, not a bot. You can download the Bitstamp app from the App Store or Google Play, or visit bitstamp.net slash pro to learn more and to start trading today. That's bitstamp.net slash pro.